Good morning. I love that. Every morning I get to sit here and do We should start doing a countdown. So I'm just not in my head doing it. But I could actually come up here and you guys can count down. I, I don't, I can't see. That's what we're going to do next week. You guys will all be a step ahead of the rest. You guys, let's stand this morning and sing some praise and worship songs as we give all the glory, honor, and praise to our maker.
about the words that you're saying. Let them fill your heart and your mind and your body. And let's ground ourselves this morning. You are
You know, you've got a love of God who told his people, take a day off. Take a day off, one out of seven, and rest. And we're going to do a series someday on the Ten Commandments. But that's one of the ones, one of the commandments that I love is, thou shalt take a day off. And that's basically what that commandment means. And you should, should take a day off tomorrow, too. But I'm just glad you're here this morning because Labor Day weekend is one last hurrah of summer and a chance for so many of our young families, especially, to be away and to take their children off for the weekend, but we're glad you're here. And I know that God makes an eternal note of every time that we gather in His name for worship. So thank you for being here. This is a special Sunday for us. It completes one year of, of Imagine Church worship. We had our soft launch the second Sunday of September, one year ago, on September 14th over at Palisades Episcopal School. Really just a handful of us, the leadership team and those who were a part of this movement from the beginning. But there's somebody in particular that I'm so proud of because Sherry Curlett today marks the one-year anniversary. She has not missed a Sunday since the Magic Church started. I think that's <laughs> Jennifer even missed one. I missed one. But uh, Sherry has been here for every one of them, and I'm proud of you for that, Sherry. But she's so self-effacing. When I mentioned that to her, she said, well, I get more out of it than, than I can imagine, so I'm glad to be here. But we're proud of you for that. I'm proud of all of you for the way that you have supported and become a part of the Imagine Church movement. We invite you to tell your friends about it as we begin to build again this fall, beginning next Sunday. As we uh, invite next Sunday morning uh, the fr our friends from upstairs, um, not from heaven, but from room uh, 203 upstairs, Rivers of Living Water, the other new church start that meets here at this beautiful campus on Sunday mornings. We've invited them to come down and join us for the opening of worship. And so their musicians will join with ours, and we'll open with uh, a wonderful set of songs, and then I'll have uh, Pastor Elaine have prayer for us. I'll have prayer for the Rivers of Living Water congregation will exchange hugs before they make their way back upstairs. But be here for that. It'll be a blessing uh, to you as we combine both worshiping bodies for the opening music of worship. Speaking of music, if you notice that Jennifer and Mike tiptoed out uh, during uh, Gregory's words, they're doing music with our Imagine Kids this morning. We're excited about that because we'll be able to hear Imagine Kids in worship in several weeks. We look forward to that, but we're proud of Jennifer and Mike for what they do with children's music on Sunday mornings. Leadership team is going to meet next Sunday evening at 7, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock over at uh, the Acting Up Carolina studio, uh, right beside CC's Pizza. We're going to get pizza and, and have kind of a dinner at the meeting together. But members of the leadership team, if you'll be mindful of that, keep them in your prayers as we start uh, working on real plans for this fall and for the winter and for our mission emphasis. By the way, we have been asked to do something in terms of mission that I know we can handle, and that is uh, to provide some meals for struggling families at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we know that the local stores will help us with this. You'll hear more about it in the coming weeks. But next week when the leadership team meets, Christina Watts, who's a dear friend of mine who used to be my um, administrative assistant and helped me do this at a, at a previous church where we put together uh, lots and lots of meals at Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. She's going to teach us how to do it. So she's going to meet with the leadership team next week. But we look forward to the mission emphasis that you're going to hear about uh, through Gregory's work among us and through our leadership team in the coming weeks. We look forward to that. But we have our kickoff for the fall youth event next Saturday, and Cahill is here to share a word about that. Cahill, share with us what's going to happen. Hey, Bruce. Uh, yes, Saturday. Uh, the weekend is almost here for that. Uh, we're doing our fall kickoff for the youth group, um, asking all of our parents and their youth to come out. This is sixth grade now. This is our middle and high school group, and it's going to be uh, quite an interesting day. Uh, it's going to be a combination of a couple devotional lessons. Gregory has been willing to write one for us, and I'll be doing one as well. And uh, we're going to have a lot of games and a lot of fun. We're also going to be talking about what we're planning on doing with the youth for the fall, um, as well as maybe some ideas of what to do for the spring. So if you're going to be coming out and joining us, that is, I actually have to correct the address. This is the new address, apparently. It's not 3916 anymore. It's now 4000 India Hook Road. You can't miss it. It's at the end, end of India Hook Road right before you hit the lake. So if, if you get to the water, you're going too far. Um, but yeah, come on out. This is down in Rock Hill. Um, dress for running around, possibly getting a little wet. Shoes you can move around in. Um, we're going to have a blast. So look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Kay Hill. We look forward to that next Saturday. I'm going to ask you to keep in your prayers um, a young woman, a young family. It was, um, I was called upon yesterday to do a funeral service for um, 
a stillborn child. His name was Lucas, and his mother is Tiffany McCloskey. And if you would pray for Tiffany and for her parents and for her son, Arlie, just one of those profoundly sad and unexplainable moments of life. But just a, a couple of weeks ago, she realized there was no heartbeat. Um, but this is one of those times that you just have to depend upon the comfort that Scripture brings because my words kind of fail at a time like that, but God's Word speaks comfort and peace. And so if you would just remember uh, Tiffany McCloskey and that little family, I'd be very, very grateful. But we begin a new series today, and that's always kind of an exciting moment for Imagine Church. And we're really going to be focusing, instead of looking at our individual walk in faith, we're going to focus on our corporate experience as the church, as we look at uh, the fact that Jesus' arrival really signaled an end to one way of relating to God, and Jesus introduced a brand new way. But as we're going to see, sometimes some of that old way of thinking continues to kind of creep into the church. But we're going to do our best, in God's grace, to keep that from happening at Imagine Church. So it's called Elephant in the Church, and over the next four weeks, maybe you'll understand a little more about what that title signifies. But to read our scripture this morning, I've invited Dana Martone to come, and we've enjoyed having Dana as a part of our faith community here. She is Gregory's sister, and what a blessing it's been not only to have Gregory, but Dana to have you here with us. Would you come and share God's word and offer prayer before the sermon today, and we thank you. come from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, Luke, chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, and John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Out of reverence for our Lord Jesus Christ, please let me ask you to stand for the reading of his word. The readings are all from the New International Version. From Matthew 16, when Jesus came to the region, of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. From Luke, chapter 22. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And from John chapter 13, A new commandment I give you, love one another, as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Heavenly Father, we ask that you open a channel for all who have gathered here in your honor and ask you to redirect us to a state of willingness to receive your grace and mercy this morning. Please bless Pastor Bruce with your divine inspiration and have him be a conduit of your words and wisdom for each of us as he delivers the message. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
worship before, but never quite, never quite that bad. Um, we are beginning a new series this morning, and we uh, completely ran out of titles, and so we had to kind of get creative. We're calling it Elephant in the Church, and we'll explain that more as we go through these four weeks together. But as I mentioned earlier, do you realize it was one year ago next weekend that a brand new church was created in the Charlotte region? And you're a part of it, because that's when Imagine Church began with our soft launch over at Palisades Episcopal School. So you've helped start a new church. But not just that, a different kind of church. One that we believe our unchurched friends won't be afraid to attend. But Imagine Church is actually a part of something greater. Because we're part of a new movement in our country and really across Europe and Canada in which church planners decided, hey, let's dispense with all of that stuff that just gets in the way. Let's try to make it a little more real with a little more community. And so if you have noticed, some of the most exciting things that are happening in Christianity today are taking place in new churches. No more steeples, no more pews, which were so uncomfortable anyway. But the church has, in so many ways, completely changed. And most of you, I suspect, haven't really paid much attention to that because you have real jobs and you're raising kids, but I really don't have anything to do. And so I have paid attention to this movement over the last 20 years. And those of you who have been on this new church journey with us, you may not know this, but you are on the cutting edge. You really are leading the way in creating a new kind of church, which is more about creating environments in which God can use churches like this one, like Imagine, to transform people's lives. You don't find choirs much anymore. People don't have to wear suits unless you're Richard Tucker, and that's just who he is. If I saw Richard in the mall uh, tomorrow and he wasn't wearing a suit, I don't think I would recognize him. But the church in America, as well as in parts of Europe and Canada, is changing. You don't have to wear a suit anymore. And ladies, you don't have to wear heels. And you don't have to wear skirts. And you can come to church if you wish, looking like you just woke up. And some of you, well, well no, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but the preaching is way more conversational. We have this big screen up here. I don't have to wear a robe. So much has changed. And I think it's great. Because the church is more accessible to people who really are into the whole religion thing, the whole church thing. And there's nothing really wrong with all that other stuff. It just kind of got in the way of how the church could grow and reach people in the name of Jesus Christ. And yet with all of that change and all of that progress and all that cool stuff and these amazing new environments, if you ever had a chance to experience what's happening in Imagine Kids, you know what I'm talking about. But in spite of all of that, the church in America today is still holding on to some things that hold us back. The local church, especially in the United States, even with all the progress, we still continue to hold on to things that hold us back. Now, if you're not a church person, or if you've had a bad church experience, if you have a tendency to kind of resist church, this is the perfect message series for you to be a part of. Because here's what we're going to discover together. Most of the things that you resist about church are things that the church should resist. Most of the things that a person would generally resist about church are actually things the church should resist about itself. And we're going to talk about some of those things. And it's going to get interesting. It may even get emotional. Some might get a little upset, but that's okay because I'm used to that. But let me put it this way. From an outsider's perspective, not as a church person or a Christian, but from an outsider's perspective, what even is the church? What is the church? Well, from an outsider's perspective, the church should be this. The church is nothing more than a community of people who follow the teaching of a man sent from God to explain God and to clear the path to God. Now, that's pretty much how an outsider should view the church. It's a community of people who follow the teaching of a man sent from God. We think he was much more than a man, but hey, you know. A man sent from God to explain God and to clear the path to God. This is what the church is. So what is there to resist about that? 
And what's more than that, this guide we follow, his primary application, his primary, here's what I want you to do, his top three commandments, actually it's just one commandment with three applications. But get this, and here's what they are. Love God, love one another, love your enemy. So what is there to resist about that? There should be nothing, absolutely nothing, resistible about the church. Years ago, when we were going through the process of adopting Joshua and Tyra was living in the Philippines, I was invited one January to come over and preach one night at a Christian crusade in Rosario in a football stadium. And I had to preach through an interpreter, which takes a little getting used to. But then I learned something that night about what Tyra calls Philippine time. That night I learned what she meant. Because the crusade was to begin at 7 o'clock in the evening. And the music started, and the crusade team who invited me there were, were there. Uh, Tyra was there, along with Joshua and some friends she had invited, but very few others. And I thought, well, this is going to be a bust. But they kept playing music, and people started arriving, and then they kept coming, and they kept coming. And by about 20 minutes until 8, when the crusade was really getting cranked up, I looked around, and this large outdoor stadium was filled to overflowing. There were literally thousands of people there. I'm pretty sure it was the loudest crowd to which I've ever preached. So, by the way, if you're not here at 10.15 when we're starting worship, I, I won't get too worked up over that. I'll just assume you're on Philippine time, okay? <laughs> but that crusade went on into the night, and when it was finally over, this long line of people came up to speak to me and to thank me and put pesos in my hand. That's a custom over there. You don't have to do that, by the way. But I remember one young woman who asked me a question that night that I've never forgotten. She came up and she touched her forehead, which is always a sign of respect. And then she said in very good English, way better than my Tagalog, she said to me, why doesn't everybody, why doesn't everybody in America go to church? And I didn't know what to say. Why doesn't everybody in America go to church? And I said, well, I need to ask you some questions. And here's what I discovered. A couple of years before this, someone had given her some Christian literature. And she had read it and listened to some things. And she had become a follower of Jesus. But she lived in a village where there was no church. And the other churches were just too far away. And it was very difficult for her to attend the church. And she'd been to church a good bit, but very inconsistently. And she loved the church. And she had heard that in the United States there were churches everywhere. And then she had heard that most Americans don't go to church, and she could not figure that out. Why wouldn't everybody want to be a part of a community that loves one another, that forgives one another? Who wouldn't want to gather to celebrate what they learned about God? Who wouldn't want to gather to learn that they've been forgiven? And in her mind, she just didn't have a category for the fact that there were Christians who had the opportunity to attend church, or just Americans, but didn't go. And so in her English, she said, Pastor Jones, why wouldn't everybody in America attend church? And I had no answer for her question. Now these are my words, not hers. But who does it? Who doesn't want their life to be better and to be better in life? And here's what you've discovered and here's what we've discovered together. When you decide to follow Jesus, regardless of what you believe about Jesus, whether you ever come to the conclusion that he's the Son of God, even if you never see him as Savior of the world, but anybody who takes the teachings of Jesus seriously, anybody who embraces the teachings of Jesus, your life will be better and you will be better at life. And who doesn't want their life to be better? And who doesn't want to be better at life? She had a good question. Why doesn't everybody in America go to church? How did we become so resistible? How is it that there are things that people say about us as reasons they don't like us that have nothing to do with the fact that we believe Jesus is ultimately our ultimate authority? Where did all that other stuff come from? What in the world happened? How did we become so resistible? Well, here's what we're going to discover. So don't miss any of this series, okay? Because here's what we're going to discover together. 
we're going to discover that the resistible factor is not the result of new things being added, but rather of old things that have been added back in. The thing that makes us resistible is not the new things that got added, but the old things that should have been left behind and got added back in. Now, to help you understand that and, and to kind of set the context for this series, I want to introduce you to something that, that we're going to call the temple model. Okay? The temple model. Now, the temple model represents all ancient religions pretty much, and it always has four components. And here's what they are. In the temple system, there's always a sacred place. There are always sacred texts, sacred men, and sincere followers. Now, I don't really know that sincere is the best word, but I wanted them all to start with an S, okay? <laughs> so in the temple model, you always have a sacred place. And somewhere housed in that sacred place are the sacred texts. And those sacred texts are controlled by, interpreted by, sacred men, it's always men, at least back in those days. And these sacred men tell all the followers, all the believers of that particular religion, here's how you're supposed to live your life. And if you don't live your life in this way, God will judge you, God will punish you, and in some cases, they'll threaten you with hell. You know, in, in mud hut regions around the world today, you'll find the same system. If you go into any mud hut region of the world, you'll find that the most important person in that community is the witch doctor. And the witch doctor has a place where everyone fears to go. And there's usually some kind of border. He doesn't need a fence. All he needs are a few well-placed skulls and trinkets because nobody will go close. It's a sacred place. And the witch doctor can fix you or heal you or curse your enemy. And the witch doctor controls the truth, controls the manifestations, and controls what people are supposed to do within that region. Now on the other side of the spectrum, we have currently in Syria and in Iraq, what do we have? We have sacred places and some sacred texts and some sacred men interpreting those sacred texts, asking people to do things that we think are horrendous, that we think are an affront to God. But in their minds, they're being consistent with what they're taught by their sacred men who control and interpret those sacred texts in those sacred places. So you see, the temple model is still alive and well in the world today. But what we're going to discover is that much of this temple thinking is alive and well in the local church as well. And anyone, anyone who can stand up and say, if you don't do the following, you'll go to hell, that person has a lot of power. In fact, the temple model grants extraordinary power to sacred men. Remember, in this system, it's always men. In sacred places who determine the meaning of sacred texts. Now, what we're going to do this, in this series is that even though the temple model is kind of trickled in to the New Testament church, it should not be that way. And here's why. The arrival of Jesus signaled the end of the temple model, not just for the Jews, not just for the ancient Jews. The arrival of Jesus signaled the end of the temple model for everybody in the entire world, for everybody on the entire planet, and the beginning of something entirely new. In fact, this is so important, I want us to say those two words out loud together, okay? Are you ready? Entirely new. How new? Entirely. Entirely new. There would be, get this, there would be no more sacred places. No more sacred places. You know why? Because Jesus would teach. Because you are sacred. And you are sacred. And you are sacred. And you are sacred. And you are sacred. And, are sacred. and when you are standing on what you would consider the most sacred spot on this planet, do not be confused. The person to your left and the person to your right and the person behind you is more sacred to God than any piece of dirt you'll ever stand on or any building you may ever visit. 
There would be no more sacred places. And there would be no more special sacred people. You would no longer need a high priest. You would no longer need anyone to tell you how to please God. There would never, ever be a time when you went to a place and someone had to beseech God on your behalf. Nobody would ever have to go before you to God because all of that would end. And the sacred text, the Old Testament, would be fulfilled, Jesus would say, with a single verb, a single word. This was the beginning of something brand spanking new. It was all new, a complete departure. How do I know that? Listen, because Jesus predicted a new movement. When he and his guys were heading up to Caesarea Philippi, the name of the city was changed by the time Jesus got his learner's permit. Uh, the name was changed to honor Caesar Augustus. And they're talking about Caesar Augustus apparently, and Jesus says, okay, now we know who Caesar is. Who do people say that I am? And they're like, well, a lot of you think you're John the Baptist reincarnated, or you think you're a prophet reincarnated. And Jesus says, well, who do you guys think I am? And Peter says, I'll tell you who I think you are. I think you're the Messiah. I think you're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one that the whole Old Testament points to. I think you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're exactly right. That is who I am. And God told you that. You didn't come up with that on your own. And then listen to what Jesus said next. Listen to this prediction. Jesus said, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, this declaration that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build future tense. I will build my church. And unfortunately, this little word should never, ever, ever have entered the New Testament. Because what, what Jesus said was the Greek word ecclesia, and it literally means gathering, assembly, movement, congregation. And in this moment, Jesus announced the beginning, not of a sacred place. Jesus announced the beginning of a brand new movement. In fact, in the first English translation of the Bible, the first English translation of the Bible, the word church does not appear. Because William Tyndale had the guts to not be, not be politically correct. He had the guts to translate the word ecclesia as it really was. He said it was a gathering, a movement. He said Jesus announced a brand new gathering of people. And what he got in return? He was burned at the stake for using that term in his English Bible. And then the super smart people who had to control everything decided, no, we're going to take a German word that actually means house of the Lord. You see, that means a specific place, a sacred place. We're going to take a German word and insert it into the English version of the New Testament, and that's where we got the word church. And that's why when you think about church, you think about place. When you think church, you think space, sacred space. And Jesus says, no, that's come to an end. No more sacred places. What I'm doing, I'm building a movement, a gathering of people. And I will be with them wherever they go. This is a brand new day, a brand new era. I am launching something brand new. Jesus instituted a brand new covenant as well. The word covenant simply means an arrangement. This is a new arrangement with God. Because before this covenant, you had to have a high priest. You had to have someone to go to God on your behalf. And Jesus said, no, I'm establishing a brand new covenant because the old approach to God, it's over. A new day has come. And God has opened the way for all mankind to approach Him directly because the final sacrifice for sin is about to be made known. Here's what he says as he gathered his disciples near the end of his ministry. He said this, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup, they had no idea what he was talking about, this is the cup of the new covenant. And they all knew that they were under a covenant because God had established a covenant with Israel. And these were good Jewish boys. We know we're in a covenant. Why do we need a new covenant? Just hang on, Jesus would say. Tonight I'm establishing a new covenant in my blood. As they stood and watched him bleed to death on the Roman cross, 
eventually it dawned on them. This is the final sacrifice for sin, and not just for us good Jews, for all humankind. And this is amazing. Because Jesus even gave new meaning and new significance to the sacred texts. One day he was teaching and the crowd went silent. This is the kind of thing that they wanted to, to stone Jesus for because it was so extreme. Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets, or basically the Old Testament. Do not think that I've come to abolish them. I've not come to abolish them. I have come to fulfill them. This was a big statement. Jesus claimed that the entire Old Testament funneled down to him as a person. Jesus claimed that all the prophets were prophesying about him. He said the Old Testament was basically a directional sign pointing in my direction. Who would say that? And then Jesus, to replace the law, because you've got to have behavioral guardrails, he said this, it's way simpler than 630 different laws. He said, in fact, it's way simpler than the Ten Commandments. Jesus instituted a new movement-defining ethic. And we're going to talk more about this in future weeks, but he gathered his followers together and he said, and here's our word again, a new command I give you, a new command I give you, love one another. That didn't sound all that new, did it? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And when he said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another, they knew exactly what he meant. Because this was not like random acts of kindness, or hold the door open, or bring you a meal when you're sick. It was way deeper than that. Because right before Jesus said this, he had taken off his outer garment as a rabbi, put a towel around, around his waist, and he had washed their dirty, stinking feet. And this made them so uncomfortable because these were the hands that healed people. These were the hands that picked up mud and put it on a man's eyes and he could see. These were the hands that had embraced Lazarus after he had been risen and he had rose from the dead. And now he was going to take those same two hands and wash their feet. And Peter said, I don't think so. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, sit down, Peter. I'm going to wash your feet. And Jesus did, don't miss this, Jesus did for them what they would not do for each other. Jesus did for them what none of them would dream of doing for each other. And then he put his outer garment back on and he said, Now, as I have done for you, this is what you are to do for one another. And guys, in those moments when you think that you're a big shot, Guys, in those moments when people sit at your feet to listen to what you have to say because you were with me. Guys, in those moments when the crowd suddenly surrounds you because you're one of the people who was closest to me. In those moments when you really think you're something, you remember this night. Because I washed your feet. And in that moment, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus took the entire leadership paradigm and he turned it completely upside down. And they never forgot it. Because it was his way of saying, when you start to think that you're one of those sacred people, all that means is you better get the towel out and you better wash more feet because that is what I want my movement to look like. And then he said to them, by this, by what you just experienced, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love just the way I love you. If you love one another. Because what I did for you, when I washed your feet, I set for you an example of how you are to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my follower if you love one another that love would replace law-keeping. That the evidence of whether or not you're a Jesus follower isn't how well you pray or how consistently you attend church. It's how well you love people who are difficult to love. And this was such a departure from temple thinking. And then Jesus did the most unimaginable thing imaginable for this group of people. This was just staggering. 
Jesus gave new meaning to the most important Jewish celebration of all Judaism. He gave new meaning to Passover. And I kept trying to think, as I was working on this, what would be an equivalent? What would be as offensive to you as this must have been to the men in that room that night? And this is the best I could come up with. If you're a Protestant, okay, if you're not Catholic, imagine that Billy Graham has requested that when he goes to be with the Lord, he's so respected that when he goes to be with the Lord, that on Christmas, that we celebrate Christmas as his birthday, and that we do Christmas in remembrance of him and his birth. It's even weird to hear me even say it, isn't it? And we say, Dr. Graham, we love you to death, but, but you're not Jesus. You're not God. Or what if Pope Francis had an idea? Because everybody loves Pope Francis. What if when he got to the end of his term as Pope and he makes his final declaration, he says, when I go to be with the Lord, from now on, when you celebrate Easter after my death, I want you to celebrate me. And we're like, <clears throat> okay, we love you, Pope Francis, but you're not Jesus. You're not God. Listen, when, when Jesus gathered with the twelve for Passover, and the scripture says he took bread and broke it and gave it to them. And he said, this is my body. They're like, no, Jesus, this is not your body. We're celebrating Passover. This has been going on for over a thousand years, you realize, 1,400 years. But Jesus says, no, this is my body given for you. From now on, when you do Passover, do this in remembrance of me. But Jesus, you're not Moses. Moses saved the whole nation. Who have you saved? Hang on, Jesus said. Who have you delivered? Jesus said, hang on. I'm telling you, when Jesus changed the significance of Passover, they should have all gotten up and left the room. But this was Jesus' most dramatic way of saying, this is not the continuation of something. This is not the temple model 2.0. This is the beginning of something entirely new. The arrival of Jesus signaled the end of the temple model in the beginning of something, let's say it together, entirely new. No more sacred places. No more special people. The Old Testament, get this, the Old Testament would be fulfilled and all of the laws reduced to a single verb. A single verb. The entire law reduced to a single verb that would be applied to God, to your neighbors, even to your enemies. And after the resurrection, after Jesus' ascension, the church got off to an amazing start. And then some temple thinking started to get blended into Jesus' follower thinking. And some things that should have been left behind got blended back in. And some traditions and some attitudes and some consciences that were so tied to the old way, they just couldn't let go of the old way because their consciences had been so fine-tuned to temple thinking. And unfortunately, much of that temple thinking is still part of the church today. And for most of it, it is the reason why the church has become unnecessarily resistant. But we at Imagine Church are going to figure this out. And we are going to let go of a lot of things that the church has been holding on to and holding, holding the church back. And we are going to do our best, by God's grace, to re-embrace what Jesus had in mind when he said, this is something new and it is for everyone. And so by God's grace, in our generation, we will be used to strip away everything that makes the church of our Lord Jesus Christ unnecessarily resistible. And for that to happen, you can't miss next week. <laughs> so God bless you. We'll see you next week for Elephant in the Church, Part 2.
those old wingtips, black suit, gray shirt, should be safe. What if we get there and they're the wrong style? We'll stick out like a sore thumb. I brought six changes of clothes. And you cleaned up, right? I mean, your act. As much as I could. And I got a new cologne called Smell Like a Rose. Don't want anyone getting a whiff of the real me. Got your passport? Yes. <coughs> your photo. Nice. That one doesn't look anything like you. But you get us in. I hope so, but just in case, I got us these smiling face buttons to remind us to put a positive spin on whatever we say, no matter how we actually feel. Speaking of what we say, I downloaded a translator app on my phone. Here, try it out. Hello. Hallelujah. Thank you. You bless my socks on. <laughs> they won't let us in without a Bible. What if it's the wrong version? No problem. I got every version there is. NIV, NASV, the new King James Version, the old King James Version, the middle-aged but still active King James Version, the revised standard version, the revised version of the revised standard version, and on my phone, the constantly being revised standard version. TLB, the Living Bible, and NTLB. What's that? The Night of the Living Bible? Anyway, are we ready? Where are the kids? Oh, they're in the chest. I wasn't sure if we had the right type of kids. But they're okay. I packed some snacks and video games.
And that simply means you'll receive as you come with open hands, which symbolize an open heart, an open spirit. You receive a piece of bread from the common loaf, and you'll dip it in the common chalice to commune. But we're also going to make our offering at this time. So if you wish to make an offering today to God's work through the Imagine Church movement, these baskets are here on the side. And after you commune, just simply drop your offering in the basket as you make your way back to your seats by the side aisles. And if you want to pause on these steps for a moment of prayer, you're certainly welcome to do that as well. We remember on that night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. That he took bread, and after he had given thanks to God, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in like manner, after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. And after he had given thanks to God, he passed it to all of them, and he said, This is my blood of the new covenant. The new covenant in my blood. Drink from this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Loving and holy God, we thank you that we do not come to this table trusting in our own goodness, but relying solely upon your gift of mercy and grace. God, we come just as we are. We may change in a thousand different ways through that gift of grace. But Lord, we realize that we do not have to change in order for you to love us. You love us just as we are. We are wonderfully and fearfully made. We are made in your image. And your likeness, despite the fact that we suppress it, we cover it up with so many other things. But deep within us is your likeness because we are made in your image. We're made with that small touch of the divine within us that is kindled when Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, comes to dwell within us. But God, we also can feel your spirit moving in our midst as this gathering of Christ's followers here. We know whenever we gather, whenever two or three are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst of them. We thank you for this holy privilege. Nourish our bodies, O oh God, but nourish our souls through your living word that speaks eternally to our hearts. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for it is one loaf of which we all partake. Is not the breaking of the bread a means of sharing in the body of Christ. Is not the cup of we, we give thanks a means of sharing in the blood of Christ? center aisle with two stations and you make your, make your way back to your seats um, to the side aisles and you may leave your offering if you wish.
songs. They stay with me all during the week. And it's not just the melody. It's the message of the songs. When you think about these words and how God speaks to our hearts through them. Thank you, Jennifer, our musicians, for what you bring to us each week with our music. We're so grateful. And I thank you for being a part of this movement and for the difference you are making in your lives and the lives of others. Look forward to these next weeks together. We feel like things are going to begin to build as God works in our midst this fall. Would you pray this after me? Lord Jesus, we love you. And we go now to serve you. Amen. You do not fail.